Okay, welcome everyone to Peace Through Action USA's virtual event called Peaceful Cities, Local Strategies for Bil Peace Building and Nonviolence. I'm happy that you decided to join us tonight. In the chat, please state your name and where you're joining us from. Um, tonight, we will explore the subject of local peace building efforts and understand how compassionate action influences social cohesion in our communities. We're pleased to share that we have an exciting panel of amazing guest speakers with us tonight who will provide perspective and commentary. We'll intersperse opportunities for discussion throughout the evening, and we invite you all to please reserve any questions or commentary for engaging breakout discussions and a Q&A conversation, which we'll hold at the end. Our guest speakers will discuss their work in their local areas throughout the country, as well as our capstone site in Calvert County, Maryland. And we are so eager and excited to share that we have a national audience with us this evening. Actually, it seems like an international audience as well. So please feel free to discuss actions or perspectives from your local areas across the country. We know that this is a diverse group. So um, we're actually really excited to have that range of experiences represented here this evening. This is a national audience national issue and tonight's events will seek to address how local actions are nested within a broader national context. But first we'll review the event arrangements. So we've already begun the event at seven o'clock p.m. It's being recorded as I've already let you all know. If you don't wanna disclose your name, voice or image, please change your participant name, mute your microphone and keep video off. Um, you may type questions or comments in the chat speaker view or gallery view is recommended. Um, and again, introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from. If you have a organization that you're affiliated with, we'd love to hear that. So thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight, we will survey the significance of peace building efforts on a local scare, scale, share resources for local initiatives and share strategies for advocacy, education and service. We'll explore methods to build and preserve a culture of harmony and justice and order by advancing community initiatives with an emphasis on peace. After attending this event, we'll enhance our understanding of this vital subject and examine the importance of social and civic engagement in our daily lives. But before we dive in, let's take a moment to consider your initial thoughts on this subject. In the chat, please share a word or phrase that comes to mind when you hear the term peaceful city. What does that term bring up for you? Please share in the chat with us. So as we move forward, here's an overview of our evening tonight. Um, we'll introduce our speakers, then we'll explore initiatives and practice. I'll also discuss needs assessments and how to perform those in your community, as well as talk about action planning, how to select the types of interventions that best fit your local area. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A conversation and reflection. We're eager to, to hear everyone's um, thoughts and questions. So before we start a dis discussion, I want to share a brief introduction to our special list of guest speakers. This evening, we welcome four featured presenters with a wide range of experience and accolades both in and beyond their local areas. Tonight, our presenters include me, Chris Wolanski, my pronouns are him, he, his, and I am the Director of Programs and Partnerships for Peace Through Action USA. We also welcome Rivera Sun. Uh, Rivera is one of our featured guest speakers from Pache Bene, who will be discussing their nonviolent initiatives, um, their nonviolent cities initiatives. We also welcome Ruth Ann Angus from Yes We Can Peace Builders, and Ruth brings a depth of experience with nonviolent approaches on a local scale. So we're eager to hear from her as well. We also have Migdalia Garcia with us and she joins us this evening and she'll be sharing about her work with the San Antonio Peace Center, which is an exciting program I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about. And lastly, we welcome our very own Mary Bonnie. Um, for those in Calvert County, you're probably familiar with Mary already, but um, she's with us tonight to discuss our cornerstone work with the Calvert Peace Project, which is something we're very, very proud of. We'll learn more about our guest speakers after we briefly discuss the nature of our work at Peace Through Action USA. 
Peace Through Action USA activates and equips Americans to implement practical, peaceful solutions to aggression and violence in their communities and our country. Um, we are a national scope organization and we have an exciting year ahead. So please spread the word to your friends and family about our virtual event series, as well as some of our other programs, which we'll talk about tonight. Um, our pro primary project of this nature is occurring in Calvert County, Maryland, which you'll all be hearing more about, but this is something that um, we're really excited for because it it's serving as an, a kind of incubation for a national scale. Um, and, and Calvert has really um, been an exemplar model that we're hoping to pattern a lot of our future work on. We also want to thank our project partners, Broadview Church. Um, they're our primary funder and supporter, and they are so integral to what we do. We're exceptionally grateful for their vision, dedication, and commitment to peace. So next, we invite everyone in the audience, you know, you've kind of shared a little bit what, of what you think a peaceful city is. You've shared where you're coming from, what organization you belong to, and now what inspired you to attend this event with us tonight? Is there anything you're hoping to learn? Um, do you have already, are you coming into this event with questions you want answered? Um, please let us know, because that helps, helps guide some of our future conversations this evening. So now we're going to explore this definition of what exactly is a peaceful city. Um, you've all presented some really good thoughts and ideas in the chat already, and I think um, I think we can all echo each other tonight on on what a peaceful city represents. But um, we can all thank Ruth Ann this evening because her organization, Yes We Can Peace Builders, has a really great definition that I that I'm going to read here um, for us all. A nonviolent city is a place of compassion, forgiveness, and love. A nonviolent city states that violence is anything that is harmful to humanity, all creatures in the planet. It is a city that fosters a culture of peace, promotes understanding, generates economic opportunity, educates its children with nonviolence as a primary element of the curriculum, improves the quality of life of those in need, shelters the houseless, and is made up of residents and civic leaders that address one another in a civil, respectful manner. So obviously this definition could accordion out to be um, very wide and it can encompass a lot of things, but I think that's a really succinct kind of expression of what we're going to be exploring tonight and how we can emulate some of the models that we're seeing um, happening around the country in our own local areas. So um, as I was composing this, presentation for, for us all tonight, I was thinking, you know, this is really kind of a utopian project in a way. Um, but I, I also kind of want to remind us that that utopia, the, the etymology of utopia is pretty interesting. Um, it comes from the Greek term um, au and topos, which literally translates to not place. Um, so I just think it's kind of interesting to consider how this definition in some way could be read to mean that humans are in a continual state of tension and there's literally no place on earth that couldn't benefit from peace building efforts. So if you're sitting in the audience and you're wondering whether any of this applies to you, I assure you that it does. Um, there is no such thing as a utopia. It's right there in the name. And with that, um, on the other end of the spectrum, I also just want to consider Gotham City, which is maybe the best example of municipal depravity. Would Batman be needed if the city took a more concerted effort to address violence's root causes? And similarly, what could happen if we directed our collective heroic energy towards more peaceful pursuits? I think it's important to frame peace building as a heroic activity to address significant issues in our lives and homes. So with no further ado, we are now going to um, explore our first featured presenter tonight. Um, we welcome Rivera Sun, one of our featured guest speakers this evening, who will share her personal experiences and reflections on the subject of nonviolent cities. 
Rivera Sun is the program coordinator for the Nonviolent Cities Project and other programs run by Pache Bene Nonviolent Service. She's an activist and the author of numerous books and novels, including The Dandelion Insurrection and the award-winning Ari Ara series. Rivera is also the editor of Nonviolence News, and her articles are syndicated by Peace Voice and published in hundreds of journals nationwide. I've included Rivera's full bio here for those who are curious, but Rivera, can you please introduce yourself and explain what inspires you to speak with our audience tonight? Thank you so much, Chris. It's a, a real honor uh, and a, a solemn honor for me today. Um, as you, some of you may have heard, the town of Lewiston, Maine just experienced a mass shooting. It's not the first this year. It probably won't be the last. It is the worst that we've had. Well, that that's, you know, the sad thing about that is that we have so many of these and it is such a continuous tragedy. This is a town uh, right next door to the sister city that I grew up in as a small child. So I went to elementary school in this area. It's very present for me. So I think what brings me, what I'm coming to this call tonight is with the, uh, the sense of fierce urgency that the work that we're going to discuss tonight is not necessarily utopian so much as at an absolute necessity for our cities, our towns, our world, and that the kind of ideas and solutions that we're talking about are things that you can implement right where you are. And that's, I think, one of the things that inspires me about the work that's being done by our dozens of nonviolent cities organizers all over the country. Should I say more now, Chris, or should I let you introduce the other speakers? Actually, this is this is your opportunity to share. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna invite you. I know you had a presentation prepared for us, so I can stop sharing now and um, wonderful. Thank you. Transition to what you have prepared. Great. So the Nonviolent Cities Project was started by our small nonprofit Pace Bene. Pace Bene means uh, peace and all good in Italian. Uh, it was started. 30 years ago, they've done so many wonderful projects. The Nonviolent Cities Project was specifically launched to work with amazing people who shared the vision that all of the systemic, structural, direct, uh, physical, psychological, and emotional, cultural violence that is being churned out day after day, year after year, by our systems, our structures, our institutions, our city governments, our policies, all of that can be changed and transformed, and that nonviolence not only provides a set of solutions to those problems, but the means of achieving the, that change and transformation. So I'm going to share my screen and just share, tell you a little bit about the stories that um, come out of this project. Here we go. So we work on many different levels. Every nonviolent city is a little bit different from the next. Some are big cities, some are tiny towns, some are mid-sized cities. And they each work to address the violence that is most pressing in their area. Some are fostering a culture of nonviolence through trainings and gatherings, uh, visual arts like murals or celebrations and public events. Others are uh, working on what we call nonviolent solutions. These might be things like affordable housing and living wages, uh, restorative justice or decarceration. Um, and there's, there's a long list of these that go by other names. But when you look at it through a lens of violence and nonviolence, you can very quickly see that people are challenging the idea that violence is going to solve our problems, that this structural violence that our world is largely constructed on isn't doing much good for us, and that we actually have viable and realistic alternatives. Along with that, the cities are working uh, to dismantle racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, and the other forms of oppression that impact the beautiful people that we all are. We also work on divesting city funds uh, and the funds of institutional uh, investments and private equity. This could include nuclear weapons, uh, private prisons and detention centers, fossil fuels. 
And we work on training families and other community members in interpersonal nonviolent skills. So, you know, the skills to solve your conflicts, the skills to de-escalate violence, the skills to stop a fight in school if you see it. Uh, and of course, that connects right up through other things like police brutality, militarized policing, um, the lack of social responders, um, the lack of the, the viable nonviolent alternatives that are often being advanced by communities of color, especially. And we ask people to go even further to understand that when we have uh, pollution, fossil fuel emissions, um, toxins, environmental racism, these are forms of violence to our communities as well. So if we're going to make all this change, you know, if we're going to achieve all these goals, we also need the means to do that. And that's where the tools of nonviolent action, things like protests, um, marches, rallies, boycotts, sit-ins, strikes, uh, divestment strategies, walkouts, all of these come in handy for pushing for those changes that we need. So that's a broad overview of what we do, but I'm going to share a few stories and uh, my colleague Ruth Ann will share what their community is doing, but I want to take you to nonviolent Opelika, Alabama, first of all. They are a small community, about 20 to 30,000 people, but they have a big problem. They have a lot of gun violence in their neighborhoods and at first, the gun violence was something that was happening locally, but the community organized and they uh, started to work with the local community to reduce the gun violence, but they still had a problem because people from other areas were coming there to their neighborhood to have their shootouts. So the moms, especially with the support of Moms Demand Action, formed a patrol and they regularly patrol the neighborhood to reduce and de-escalate violence, which is having an impact. They also hold regular peace walks with the community. They have a youth leadership program. Um, and they, you know, teach and train their community in the principles of nonviolence from Kingian nonviolence and nonviolent action. Next, I want to talk a little bit about non Twin Cities Nonviolent in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. They do so much amazing work. I could talk all night, but I'm going to tell you just about one program, which is their uh, collaboration with Emerge and Nonviolent Peace Force. Emerge is a local group that helps um, former gang members and people coming out of prison find new jobs and employment and a different role in the community. Nonviolent Peace Force is a large international organization that goes into hot conflict zones and stops wars. So they collaborated in North Minneapolis to actually stop a local Catholic school when the school was going to implement armed police officers for security in the school, these three groups, Twin Cities Nonviolent, Emerge and Nonviolent Peace Force, trained local community members to do unarmed peacekeeping, to de-escalate fights. These young men show up every morning before school starts. They patrol the perimeter. They move drug dealers away from the school nonviolently. They escort the students and the teachers into the building. They help the students de-escalate the fights and conflicts that might arise. They are paid to be there from the start of school to the end of school. This is the kind of nonviolent infrastructure that every city needs. Other programs that are happening with nonviolent cities include the work that's being done in Rochester, New York with our colleagues at the MK Gandhi Institute who are a nonviolent Rochester. They do a number of programs, including training all the middle school kids in conflict skills. It's a massive endeavor that happens every year, which is incredible. They also do things like make big public displays, urging nonviolence, uh, opposing violence, and even doing stealth projects where this is a, a bus and billboard campaign that invites people to think in ways that are calming, de-escalating, recentering, um, and these were going around on the city buses. Um, and the city buses donated the space. It was an incredible civic campaign. They also do things like a self-run uh, role-playing de-escalation and conflict skills experience based on theater of the oppressed. 
In nonviolent Lancaster, PA, they are campaigning to move $150 million of city funds out of weapons, nuclear weapons, guns, and fossil fuels. This is a resolution that they got passed last year that is one of the steps to getting the money to actually move out of all of those things. If every institution stopped funding those along with prisons and detention centers, we would be living in a very different world. And why should our civic funds be invested in these things that are causing so much destruction and harm? Uh, Nonviolent Owensboro has a number of great projects. One of the things they do annually is they make a display at the public library advocating and advancing peace and nonviolence. This is something a lot of our nonviolent cities do because when we don't speak up for this, the default setting in our world is not peace and nonviolence. We are always promoting violence on television. Uh, things are not particularly peaceful. So we have to take an active stance, like these yard signs that they made with quotes from social justice organizers and peace builders that then get put up around the neighborhoods. And indeed, I even went on a tour of Owensboro from one uh, yard to the next. We love it when our nonviolent cities uh, do creative projects, especially with youth that help bring the consciousness of peace and nonviolence to youth's mind. Uh, our, one of our new collaborations is with uh, Peace Week Arkansas uh, and the Arkansas Peace and Justice Coalition. They have for many, many years run this incredible program that works with local youth in creating peace art, which then they give awards to and display in the rotunda of the state capitol building for a week around the International Day of Peace. Some of this work goes on to inspire others. Uh, peace Week Delaware also did a project around art, which then inspired nonviolent Seaford to do an art display that was fully supported by the local library. And uh, when they were struggling to come up with the funds to throw the reception, when their local civic leaders stepped in and helped make that happen. So we, I could go on all night. Every single one of our nonviolent cities is doing something fascinating and powerful to reduce one of the kinds of violences that are present in our world. These all, not only advance peace in our communities by building a peace rooted in justice, the strategies by which they achieve these goals are rooted in peace building, bringing together unexpected allies, uh, building real community relationships and partnerships, and indeed using the tools of nonviolent action as well. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you have lots of questions for me. I'll put some links in the chat box about where you can learn more. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rivera. Your work is amazing, and we're really grateful to have you this evening. And thank you for reminding us that this is vital and necessary work. Um, so thank you so much for that. OK, next, we would like to welcome Ruth Ann Angus, one of our featured guest speakers this evening, who will share her nonviolence work with her organization, Yes, We Can Peace Builders. Ruth Ann is the director of Yes, We Can Peace Builders, a division of People of Faith for Justice, San Luis Obispo, California. She's also a facilitator and trainer of nonviolence practices and principles and coordinates the Nonviolent Cities Project in San Luis Obispo, Luis Obispo County, California. In addition to teaching workshops in positive peace building with area youth groups, she holds monthly peace workshop discussion groups with members of the adult community. She co-created the website for the Beatitude Center with international peace activist John Deere and helped establish the center, which offers online lectures by many prominent peace activists, authors, and speakers. I've included only parts of Ruth Ann's bio here because um, it is extensive and she's been doing this work for a while. But for those who are curious, please visit our website, um, which I'll, I'll share with you um, this evening. Ruth Ann, can you please introduce yourself and explain what inspires you to speak with our audience tonight? Thank you so much for having me. I'm enjoying being here and listening to everything and had a nice review from Rivera about everything. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing, folks? All these cities, all these people are doing all those things. All those components that she mentioned is happening. And I don't think we get enough of that word out 
to let people know this is happening. We all know the problems. I just saw some in the chat box of what you're really worried about, what's really concerning you. And uh, you need to know that there's a lot of work going on. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need more. So if you're not doing it in your city, I invite you to join. And I think a lot of times people will be reticent to join something like this because I have to admit to you, it's a lot of work. It's uh, It takes time. You have to have patience. And you have to be a little bit diplomatic. At least this is what I found to be the case. I live in a very small town, really, in comparison to most of the cities in the country. We only have a, upwards of about maybe 10,000 people, and I think half of those are children. So you're looking at really 600 households. And I know that for a fact, because I'm a journalist, and we know where we send the newspapers here, and they go to 600 households. Not a lot of people, but you're surrounded by communities, too. And I'm surrounded by other areas that are larger than us but not necessarily incorporated cities. And the benefit I had was that it was an incorporate, is an incorporated city because I got to be a little bit annoyed with the uh, behavior of our city fathers, especially during election time. Uh, I didn't think they acted very well towards each other. And I saw that as violence in my opinion. So I wanted to do something about that and in literally just going through the internet to find out where we put in the word peace or peace organizations. What will you get? And you can get a lot of information. One of the informations that I got was Pachi A. Benny. So I clicked on that little thing and got onto the top of it, started, it was before they had not, the, the website they have right now is a lot easier to use, but the one before you had to kind of fish around. So I'm fishing around on this website and really distressed with what's going on in my community, not just with my city fathers, but also with the, with the community at large for their attitude towards the homeless people, because we have had an enormous influx of homeless in this area. So here I am looking for some help and I'm scrolling down and scrolling down on their website and I hit something that said, the nonviolent city project. Bingo, I clicked. And without even thinking about the, what ramifications I'm going to have from this, I signed up. And then I had to figure out, well, where do you begin? What do you do? How do you do this? So I want to know if you're interested, you have to go to that website and take a look because there's wonderful instructions about how to start this. But you have to think about your own city and you have to think about what is it that's on your mind in relation to your community as it pertains to violence. What kind of violence do you have? I've seen a couple of things in the chat box, apparently a lot of gang violence in a lot of places, domestic violence. Um, I don't know of any area that doesn't have some kind of violence. We have it too. We, we primarily, at that particular year that I started it, we had two murders, two suicides, and a lot of other types of domestic violence going on. And for Morrow Bay to have even one murder in 10 years is probably a lot. So for two in that particular year, which was a very disturbing year for people, that really got me thinking of what can we do to turn this around? And I realized that education was really part and parcel of what we would have to do. So I formed a little committee. Actually, we had 14 people that started this. And uh, we started talking about what can we do? How can we help to try to come up with some ideas of where to go? Some of the instructions that we had at that time, because we were dealing with, you know, John Deere was running the thing at that point, And his idea was go immediately to your mayor and your city council. I knew that that would not work in Morro Bay without doing a whole lot of pre-work, talking to these people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I spent a, the better part of a year making sure that I met up with each one of the city council people somewhere in town at some function and always brought up the fact that I wanted to do something in conjunction with them to cur you know, put a curfew on violence in our town. And out of that, we, we ended up um, really having some particularly good progress with our police department. Um, I, I literally at one time after a couple of racial incidents that happened here, just walked into the police department and said, I like, I would like to talk to the police chief. Now, I know you can't do that in every major city in the town, 
but um, not without caution, at least. And in some cases, there's lots of hoops that you're going to have to jump through. But don't stop. Don't don't not do it. You really need to talk maybe with your police department. It was the best thing I ever did was walking through that door, asking to talk to the police uh, chief. At the time, we didn't particularly have a police chief that was really helping our community. And we did some turning around on that and got better people in place, started programs. And we now have a terrific community uh, relationship with the police. They really go out of their way to work with us. That doesn't mean that we don't have problems. That doesn't mean that the police don't come with their guns still in their host look to a lot of our events. And I wish we would get them out of our school because we do have a school resource officer that is there with a, a gun on our hip. I was be feeling very proud about our town recently because I thought we have not had any kind of uh, threat of violence that has to do with mass gun shooting and what have you. And I was feeling pretty good about it because all of the high schools around here have had at least one incident. And I'm very sad to have to tell you that unfortunately we have joined the group. It lets me know that kids are really struggling. And because of that, about a year ago, I realized that we needed to really start talking to the young people. And I was wanting to start at the high school level. For some reason, um, uh, it just didn't work that way. And I ended up starting with the kids at the after school program called Kids Club. And we decided we would do the International Day of Peace. And you can see one of the posters here um, is from that first day that we did the International Day of Peace. I decided to just get them to do drawings of peace and let's talk about it and let's see where you're going. So we had a good long discussion about diversity, about uh, being inclusive, bullying. Every single one of my sessions with kids that I did throughout the county um, brought up the fact that they're struggling with bullying. And uh, we need to be sitting down with children and helping them through this mental health you know, for kids, it's tough right now. So that's a program that we have ongoing and it's going to grow. As a matter of fact, next week, I get to, to meet with the principal of the local grammar school to see what more we can do to and now get the kids involved in doing peace work. And they are interested in doing this. And these are uh, school kids. They won't be any older than nine or 10 years old that have formed a little club and they want to do this. We, this is the kind of thing you want to get rolling in your community or you want to get rolling with your adults. Humanitarian aid. We have a huge humanitarian aid program thing going. That's basically what my nonviolent cities project works on at this point, because we do have a severe problem with homelessness and poverty. It looks like such a wonderful area here. If you come to Morrow Bay, it's absolutely visually beautiful. It's a, a great nature place. But violence is violence and it's everywhere and even if it's only something in your mind even if it's some way you you speak to someone else and i think teaching the fact that the, this also is violence and it's not just guns it's not just war it's it's not just murder etc so uh <laughs> yeah rivera's got a little note to me here paying it forward the mutual aid keeps violence at Bay and Morrow Bay. It's an article on the uh, on the website. Please go and read it because it really has worked here, um, particularly with our homeless who uh, we have had a lot of altercations that have started up. But as we begin to help them, as we began to give them the, the process that they could go through to get out of homelessness, uh, we have several days throughout the week that we we have meals for them. And that also includes anybody in the community that's struggling financially that they could come and have a free meal. And that's when you can get to talk to people and sit down and have one-on-one -on -one conversations and try to help them through these things. Uh, mutual aid has been huge uh, to really turn around the violence here. And I think it's kept our domestic violence thing down quite a bit. Uh, we don't suffer with gangs in this area very much um and i that's a blessing but always expect that you're going to possibly run into something on that on that top of thing happening with kids we really need to do a lot more work with our youth i think they're really struggling um 
if you have questions for, I don't know what else to tell you. It's just, we've been really successful with the police action and our community action. Our city council has given me two uh, peace proclamations, one right after the other. It's supposed to be for the community, but they keep giving it to me. And uh, I wanna see what this chat was because I see it's from my friend, Teresa. Okay. If you read this from Teresa, she says she's in a neighboring city, Tomorrow Bay, where Ruth Ann is. Our school has a peacekeepers, peace leaders for the school culture with a school assembly each Friday. The school that she's in is, I believe, in Cambria, which is two towns north of us. And you'll see as you read this that she also has a partnership with the Rotary Club. I, too, have a partnership with the Rotary Club. Um, I've been in Rotary for about 17 years. And this year I am their peace builder chair. So I have several projects that we're going to put into place, particularly for peace literacy with the kids, where I'm going to be obtaining four different books. The topics are diversity, empathy, bullying, and belonging. And I'm going to be able to purchase enough of those books to give it to the whole class. So 30 or 40 books that the kids can take home. Not only will it help them with their reading because we realize that there's a problem with comprehension and reading with many of our kids. And, uh, but it will also have the messages that we want them to, to get. So that's a project that Rotary is going to fund here. Uh, that's a source for you. Rotary, the Lions Club, the Kiwanis, uh, organizations that you can collaborate with. It's very important. I have 15 different agencies and organizations that really sit on the Nonviolent Cities program with me. And they help a lot because each one does their thing and you can get them to work together to do this. The city of Morro Bay gave two peace proclamations. They also came out with a really, really stringent gun ordinance in this area. We have a lot of uh, transients coming in. We have a lot of visitors coming here. We put on events each year, and many of these events are held in the city, in the streets. Um, during COVID, it became obvious to us that uh, we were going to have some problems with events like this. Uh, up in Gilroy, they had a shooting that uh, was very unfortunate. And the Gilroy Garlic Festival actually had been going on for years and years and is no longer because of that. It made me realize how easily somebody could come and do a gun violence type thing, a mass shooting at some of our street events. So I went to the city council and said, this is a problem. We need to get together and see what we can do about it as far as maybe if you're going to hold events, hold them in an area that you can better supervise. When you only have a police force that has 18 people on it, you can't expect them to all allocate more than two people to an event. And if the event is bringing in 10 to 15,000 people, you could really have a serious problem. These were the kinds of issues that we had to get into in order to turn things around. So what happened is some of the events have been canceled and some of the events have been reworked in such a way to try to keep people safe. The, uh, the work goes on all the time. I, it's an everyday thing. I don't let a week go by that I don't have some contact at least with my primary people that are working with the Nonviolent Cities Project. And we always have something, some project that we're working on to, to go forward. I don't know if you have some questions for me. I'd be happy to answer them. I can't, I don't wonderful. see myself here, so I'm looking <laughs> at your presentation, and I don't know where my eyes are going, but I am paying attention to you. You've done great, Ruthann. Thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna hold our questions till the end, but I'm I'm eager to learn more about your collaborations that you're doing. It sounds sounds like really important and amazing work. So thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, and we're we're very grateful to have you with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, so yeah, we have two more guest speakers. We're gonna we're gonna move through that rather quickly because I do want to preserve some time for um, our audience to to field their questions and have an opportunity to connect with each other. Um, but now we would like to welcome Migdalia Garcia, one of our featured guest speakers this evening, who will share her work on a more citywide scale with the San Antonio Peace Center. Migdalia Garcia of San Antonio, Texas, is a passionate peace and social justice educator and practitioner at Northwest Vista College. Her borderland beginnings have shaped her intersectional approach to living, 
learning, and scholarship. Currently, she leads the San Antonio Peace Center with a wonderful team of activists. The center collaborates on various programs and initiatives that foster strong connections with the campus and community to cultivate compassion, challenge structural inequities, and promote our collective well-being. Migdalia, can you please introduce yourself and explain what inspires you to speak with our audience tonight? Y'all, thank you so much. Good evening. It's wonderful to be together, gathered in compassion and community. So wonderful to be here. Um, I want to start with San Antonio is a compassionate city. I would love for us to also be a nonviolent um, city. <clears throat> and the, the mayor did a great job the other day of helping me reframe that. And he said, well, Meg, we were a compassionate city before we signed on to the Charter for Compassion, right? That's just the framework that gives you an official designation, but it's really the people in the community that make our living and learning together so vibrant and so wonderful. So just a little bit about our humble beginnings, and then um, I want to transition to a project that we have worked on for the past year. So in 1994, many of you in the chat had mentioned gang violence. And so in 1994, there was a summit held for people who were impacted, affected by gang violence. And it was parents, it was educators, it was gang members themselves. And they learned different skills and different practices to be more peaceful, to be more nonviolent. And so a beautiful, burgeoning, connective event brought together healing for this community. And through that experience, we had our three founding mothers, Rosalind Collier Falcon and Helmke and Susan Ives, they started the Peace Center in 1994. And a lot of the things that have been mentioned, they held community rallies, um, vigils for diff different events. They activists, they went to city council. And one of the big things they did was work in a, on a very grassroots level to address issues of violence and issues of peace. And it was in working through the community and really addressing the basic needs that we have for cooperation and love and peace that the city council and the mayor came to them. And when they did that, they were able to say, okay, we are gonna be a compassionate city. We are going to be a compassionate San Antonio. Um, so fast forward 30 years, and we like to say that the Peace Center came to college, right? It's never too late to um, come to a community college, which is in and of itself so important, y'all, because it gives access to higher education that many people in our community would not have access to. So that's really a point of pride for me. But in doing so, we said, look, we have um, things like through our curriculum. And, you know, Rivera, when you were talking about structural inequities and in institutions, Higher education can be one of those institutions that's that's very oppressive. And so what we try to do through our curriculum that's interdisciplinary and across disciplines is help students address, find solutions within themselves, within their families, within their, their communities on how to be more just. So it's very practical piece. Someone said, well, do you have students that go to become foreign service officers? And I said, we do, but mostly we have a lot of students that stay in our city. And so if they themselves can be more compassionate to one another, to their families, to their clients, to their customers, then we know that we've done a great job in our education. So that's one strand of what we do through our curriculum. Um, the other strand is that we do wholeness and renewal. So really um, reflective practices, practices that um, call for mindfulness, that's one avenue. And then we have our community piece and it's how do we um, how do we collaborate with the different projects that already exist, right? People in little small pockets are already doing these things. And so how do we connect and lend and offer support? Um, and then the fourth thing that I wanted to talk about was the project that I said we had been working on for the past year. It's called Compassionate USA. And I'm gonna drop it in the chat because I don't know if we can share the screen, Chris, or um, if we can somehow get it up so everyone can see it. Yeah, here, I can I can stop sharing and... Okay, I'll perfect. So I'm, I'm going to share my screen, y'all, just so you can see a little bit of what's kept us busy. 
So Compassionate USA, y'all, was birthed out of a congregation of mayors. And this was right after the shooting in Uvalde. So, you know, those of you that talked about gun violence. So when we had these children, right, uh, that were murdered and also uh, killed, we said we got to do something. So it was community conversations that were taking place. And as you know, Texas is a big, very, very prideful state. And we also have a lot of gun owners. And our policies around it are not very strong. So the mayor challenged us to give a gift to the world. And what was birthed was we thought, why don't we create some short videos, some very basic concepts so that people can have a, have a tool, have an avenue, have an invitation to compassion and peace. And so what we did was we created six videos. Each of them has a contemplative mindful practice at the end of them, but it's, it's on taking action for yourself for others, for your families, and then sy systemically, we look at systematically, how do we address some of these issues? Each video is about six to eight minutes and everything's free. So everything that you see on the website, we really did keep it as a gift to the world. You can use it in whatever ways that you see fit. There's video discussion guides that go with it. Um, there's self-guided questions. So they're really lovely and I think very well curated. I'm a little biased, um, but I've also, um, you know, have just been so fortunate to work with these really gifted individuals. There's also a micro course and it's a little more involved. You do get a credential at the end of it, but what I want to say about the micro course is it takes about 20 hours to complete. It is again, all free. Um, there is a credential. Talk about collaboration. We, when we started this, it was gonna be a charge of about $50 a person. And as we continue to iterate and really give our message of hope and peace and why we decided to do this, people chipped in. So Coursera, which is a large learning platform, allowed us to do this for free. And then Credly, which gives the badge, which are all the rage now, also decided to donate that for free. So it's all free. Um, to you. And then we have a partners page. We're saying, hey, if you want to be a part of our compassion movement, if you want to partner on different projects, why don't you sign up? Be a partner. These are all the, the partners that are here so far. Um, but we really want people to take this material, use it as their own, tell us what works, what needs a little bit of tweaking, um, but, it, but it's up there for you, and it's what we've dedicated our time to this, this past year. It's not the only project we do, like the ones that I mentioned earlier, that we also invite partnership, um, invite dialogue, invite brainstorming. It's what we've spent the better part of a year doing. So I invite you to utilize it, and I hope that it's useful to you and that we continue here on this call, and again, even the connections that are forged after this, to be in community with one another, making our world more just and peaceful. Thank you. Thank you, Magdalia. It's great to have you tonight, and thank you for sharing about your work with the San Antonio Peace Center and Compassionate USA. We're really excited to learn more about them. So thank you for being here with us. Um, we'll now transition to, to welcoming Mary Bonnie, one of our featured guest speakers this evening. And she's gonna talk about our flagship project with the Calvert Peace Project. Mary Bonnie of Prince Frederick, Maryland is a peace agent with Peace Through Action USA. Um, she's responsible for organizing and delivering the Calvert Peace Project, a civic and social engagement project for youth and adults in Calvert County, Maryland. Mary, can you please introduce yourself and explain what inspires you to speak with our audience tonight? Yes, absolutely. So like you said, I'm Mary Bonnie. I'm the peace agent um, for our kind of, I guess, our pilot program for this, um, for these peace projects. Um, it started here in Calvert County. I grew up in Calvert County. I have a lot of love for the area and uh, 
I am also very aware of areas it might uh, need to improve. <laughs> so we're fortunate enough not to have any um, major displays of it violence thus far, and we're grateful for that, and we hope to continue that. But there's obviously still areas where we can improve with our connectivity with one another, with um, our connection between organizations who want the same thing uh, in discussing difficult topics, et cetera. So that's kind of where this was born out of. Um, as Chris mentioned, we have our wonderful um, supporters at Broadview Church, and they approached the project or approach Peace Your Action USA and said, hey, you know, we want to promote peace in the area and we just need kind of more resources to do it. We need a little bit of help to do that. So um, the Peace Project was born out of their efforts and uh, the efforts of Peace Your Action USA. So I'm really grateful and fortunate to be a part of that and kind of leading that on a local scale. Uh, we have a lot of really cool projects going on all the time, and we're continually growing. I would say the ones of note. Most recently, um, we have a healthy youth program. Um, just today, I was in two middle schools teaching nonviolent skills and communication skills to the students there. We also work with an awesome after-school program called the Adolescent Clubhouse, uh, which helps kids in substance recovery to make better choices and uh, develop skills that will help them throughout their lifetime, including these nonviolent skills that we offer to them. We were also able to paint a mural with those same kids that turned out beautifully and reflected their efforts to, um, oh, there you go. So this is part of our youth program. Um, we painted that mural together and that reflected our efforts to uh, continually think about peace and choose peace, which was amazing. We also offer events like these, virtual events and in-person events for adults who maybe want to continually improve and know how to communicate with their families and within the communities. And recently we also started um, what we're calling the Peace and Justice Table, which is an opportunity for like-minded organizations to coordinate their efforts in peace building and improving the community um, which we're really excited about uh, because I would say one of the main issues that we deal with that prevents pr peace is a lack of communication and coordination in between different organizations. Because as we all know, there are plenty of people in the world who want to do right, but it's hard to get connected and in with the right people in order to do those things. So we're hoping to offer a platform for those organizations to do that. So yeah, did I miss anything, Chris? <laughs> I don't think you covered it. That was great. Okay. Thank you. And again, just just like everyone else, we're we're equally grateful to have you with us tonight. So thank you so much for being here, sharing your thank perspective you. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now we're going to move into a bit of a discussion. Um, you know, I really, I really kind of just want to express. There's two main steps here. Um, one is performing a needs assessment of your community. Um, you know, and that's born out of out of a question, what issues or areas of focus might a peace building effort address in your community? And so your goal is really to identify what subsection of the community could benefit from work, you know, what kind of areas of focus might we have? Um, and I'll talk about the strategies that you can implement to, to perform that needs assessment. And then after that, you're going to devise an action plan. Do you have any ideas for how your city town could take action for peace? Envision a plan of action. A lot of times we often feel that we need to envision it ourselves and that there's not already things happening in the community. So I just challenge you all who are sitting here tonight that there's already a Mary Bonnie probably in your town or or nearby. And if not, then, then become that person. Um, but but I do just want to encourage that um, we don't always have to reinvent the wheel and and these projects really flourish through community. Um, so if you can lend your your efforts and your energy towards something that's already happening in the community or at least collaborate, as Ruthann talked about, it's a great opportunity to um, to maximize your impact. So in order to perform a needs assessment, you're going to interview people. 
in the community and get insights from key stakeholders, community members, organizations, individuals, and groups. What is important to people? What are the things that people are concerned about? A lot of the things that we're seeing in the chat this evening are, are in a rudimentary sense, a needs assessment of where we're at as a collective. Um, action plan, in order to take that needs assessment and, and make it actionable, you need to really ensure that your work is accessible for community members. Um, are, you, are you thinking about designing a program that no one is gonna actually have time to attend? Um, that's something you wanna consider. Um, so this is one of those opportunities where the collaborations that you have with other people in your community can really provide very important insight into how you move forward. So I just kind of wanted to present that for everybody to, to kind of consider. Um, next, I have um, an opportunity that I'm really eager to share as well. Um, Peace Through Action USA is pleased to share great news that AmeriCorps, the Federal Agency for National Service and Volunteerism, has awarded us a grant to plan a national service program focused on increasing peace in the United States. Peace Through Action USA is accepting applications through Friday, December 8th from community organizations and even individuals um, that wish to join us in requesting AmeriCorps National Service members to confront social discord within their communities. Peace Through Action will include qualified community organizations in its upcoming application to AmeriCorps to operate Peace Through Action AmeriCorps. And so here's the main goal of our work. Um, essentially, we're, we're intending to implement civic engagement, social cohesion, peace building interventions in socially stressed communities which seek to bridge divides between, unite, and increase peace among their people and in their places. So the goal is to be a national service corps for peace. When you hear the phrase Peace Corps, you often, um, it's, uh, it, we sometimes miss the fact that we don't really have a national service corps for peace in our own country. Um, and some of the, the tragedies that we're experiencing um, which Rivera talked about, you know, just are are really um, writing on the wall that this is that this is necessary. Um, so we envision Americans increasing peace in their communities in perpetuity, and that is that is the goal for a long term vision. So if you're interested in that, please contact and reach out. Um, here's the contact information for that, and I'll also include that in the chat here for us. Um, and similarly, if you want to engage in this opportunity, um, please, please do so. <laughs> um, use these links, and I'll also put that in the chat for your reference. And this will also be in follow-up correspondences, so um, don't feel like you need to have it tonight. But um, just want to put that out there for everybody. So now we're going to transition into a Q&A. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the chat. Um, so really just kind of want to prompt anybody and everybody, if you have a question for one or multiple speakers, please do so. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and we can move into just a kind of casual conversation for the time being. Any questions at all for anybody? Yeah, Teresa, go ahead. Well, what's most concerning, of course, is in the Middle East and how are we going to advocate and have peace over there when people keep saying, oh, well, but they did this, so we've got to retaliate. And even our government is saying that. And so that's, that's top on my list of concerns. Besides everyone's city projects, of course. I want to see what people think. Well, I think uh, briefly, there's many kind of ways that we think about that, one of which is, you know, continuous training for nonviolent action. So our communities are ready to respond when crises like this hit. And we understand how to do that strategically. The other thing is that a lot of what's going on in Israel-Palestine right now is causing dissension and strife and even violence right here in our, 
our communities. Uh, we've heard tragic stories of hate crimes that have happened in the U.S. Uh, because of the violence that's happening uh, in Gaza. And so, you know, that's where some of the work to train people in de-escalation, to do social cohesion comes in. It's all very deeply connected, as I'm sure you have seen as well, Teresa. So I think wherever we can work on the issue is critically important, and it it informs each other, right? We, if we allow our communities to believe in an eye for an eye, that's how the whole world ends up blind, to paraphrase Gandhi on that. Uh, but if we help our communities learn to open their eyes from small conflicts, such as with bullies, to international conflicts, and to un really understand that there are better ways to solve the problems that we face, then we can really realistically start to address some of the global um, crises that are going on, and including our role as a nation in them. Yeah, and yeah. Teresa, I, I thought I thought that taking that on would be kind of difficult, but I'm so pleased because I got your note that you are going to. And I don't. I need to tell you something. What Teresa does in Cambria with the Peace Corner, they they silently and quietly stand on the corner with their placards, positive statements in those placards. And they and the traffic goes by and the message is there. And I think, Teresa, that's a big thing that you're doing. And, and I know you and I'm planning to do this for about the Gaza and Palestine and uh, Israel issue. But again, bringing it back down to our communities, I think we really have to be willing to to talk and to listen. Um, I have a, a Muslim friend who is terribly disturbed. She's got friends who lost family over there, et cetera. And now she no longer has any faith whatsoever in the United States of America. And the best thing I can do for her really is to really listen. Um, without any advice, without any judgment, let her express what her feelings are and uh, and literally pray that she'll be able to, you know, suffer through this because it is a suffering. Um, but I just personally would like to thank you for what you're going to do standing on that, that corner. Yeah, that's your community work. That's good. Yeah. I don't know if Brother Ken is still in the audience here, but I saw that he raised his hand. Yep, I'm here. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I uh, I find this really in, this this really interesting confluence of a lot of different angles, which is like really um, has got my attention. One is that um, I'm the Minister General of the Lutheran Franciscans, and I was in St. Louis a couple of weeks ago with the. TSSF, which is the Third Order Society of St. Francis. And I met a guy named Jim Crosby, who is one of the leaders for um, Nonviolent Austin. And I, I just loved a guy. I, I, as we were chatting during the week, he just had this, this presence about him. And then at the uh, at the end of the time that before I left, he handed me this and he said, you should check these guys out. I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I've been really busy since I got back home. I, I live in Calvert County. Um, I'm a pastor in Huntingtown, Maryland um, at St. Nicholas Lutheran. And so, so I have that connection. Um, also, um, Jim said that he went to Owensboro and met with the person in charge there. Owensboro is where I was born and where my deep family is. So I'm kind of like, okay, there's another thing there. I served in a Prince of Peace Lutheran church in San Antonio about 17 years ago. And so I'm kind of like, oh, okay, I've got that there. And, and then um, I guess Mary Bonnie is here at, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, what church or whatever affiliate, are you still with Broadford if you church? Mary? Yeah, so the project is non-denominational. It's not religious. It's a community project. But yes, we are primarily funded by Broadview. Right, by Rob, and you're still housed at All Saints. Yes, they are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um. 
so anyway, so all these, you know, different things. So I'm like, um, I'm in, I, I guess I've, I've, I'm awake now. Some, something's telling me something. And so, um, just let me know how I can, uh, start getting involved. I'll probably start with Mary since we live in the same County. Um, but, and, uh, the other thing is I'm going to, it, uh, Italy this summer with Pace Abeni, and I'll be talking with Ken Budigan, who has written about nonviolence as well. So anyway, I was probably a lot more information than any of you guys really wanted to know, but, um, I just, uh, I'm just, this has really got my attention and I've been looking for something, um, to kind of, uh, have my community dig into, and this just seems perfect. So let me know. That is wonderful. Brother Thank, Ken. You. Thank you for sharing that. That's really, uh, serendipitous that you're connected to all these little nodes of this project. So yeah. um, we're eager to have you join us with the Calvert Peace Project. And thank you for being here tonight with us. Yeah. Great. Okay. I'm seeing Dr. Stephanie raise her hand, but I think I saw Francois had their hand earlier. So I'm not sure, Francois, you still have a question? I think you're muted. Okay. Is, it my, is it my turn? I don't know why I'm frozen now. I'm not sure. Anyway, I can, can you hear me? Yes, can hear can you. you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm sorry I joined a little late because I went to a, a Centerville Civic meeting, an important one, Civic Association meeting. I, I live on in Massachusetts on Cape Cod. And I have a feeling you are all from another area. <laughs> um, at, uh, the word nonviolence that I have heard and that I see on the screen with you, Rivera, um, brings me back to um, 30 years ago when I was going through a time in my life where I felt a lot of vi violence in, in me. And somebody introduced me to a, a nonviolent group when I have no idea what the concept of nonviolence was. And briefly, two things. Nonviolence is a long project and choice of change in our own life, each one of us. And one thing I learned is that we don't suddenly put a nonviolence answer to a crisis. So um, the work of, of nonviolence that you are all doing, I feel, is going to have is, is going to have a good impact but it could be after we are gone. But as much as we join together in that spirit, we make progress. Uh, two young women started a little organization, not so young because they were both grandmothers, on Cape Cod called Grandmothers Against Gun Violence. And they started two of them and it grew, we now vigil once a month and at the Rotary, and there are about 50, 60 of us. Then we recently joined other groups around the country. And, and now there are, there are many groups. There is a grandparents for safety of our grandchildren, uh, mothers um, against guns. So, Things go slowly. What I'm trying to say, um, they, it goes slowly, one by one. But it goes somewhere, and we need to believe that. We need to believe it in it because it's the right thing to do. Justice, peace, nonviolence, solidarity, compassion. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Do any of our speakers have any thoughts on what Francois had to share? 
Well, just briefly, Francois, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your journey uh, towards nonviolence and to nonviolence and uh, speaking to how this word that our culture has so much trouble wrapping its mind around, it is a journey. Thich Nhat Hanh said it was a direction, not a separating line. And we're always moving, well, not always, but hopefully we're always moving in that direction of nonviolence. And I think that's a guiding principle for me in this work is, you know, every time the moms in Opelika stop another shooting from happen, that's immediate, right? Have we solved the entire problem of gun violence yet? No. <laughs> but we have solved it for that one family right there in that moment. And those are the things that keep you going is when you see those tangible milestones of change, the impacts on people's communities, the stories that Migdalia shared about how their community kind of uh, came together to really address the violence that was going on. I really want to learn more about that so at some point, Migdalia. So yeah, I, I share so much empathy with you for, for the care and the thank you for the work that you're doing with the grandmothers and getting out there. Wonderful, yeah. All right, and Dr. Stephanie, I think you had a question. Uh, yes, um, thanks to all of you for the work that you're doing and just a couple of comments. Um, how many of you have heard of the uh, National Community Violence De-Escalation Training Act that Congresswoman Gwen Moore is trying to get passed? It would provide about $500 million in training for de-escalation. So if you haven't heard about it, I encourage you to. She's introduced it a couple of years, but it hasn't gone anywhere. And I think we need more funding and would be interested in your reactions as to whether you think there's more funding that is needed to really get this change going. And then the second question or comment that I'd like to make, our organization, Black Women for Positive Change, which is multicultural with men members and different generations, we think the core problem is the culture of America. We think that the fact the culture started with the genocide against the Native Americans, then we shifted into the slavery involving people from Africa. And we had the indentured people coming from Europe out of Scotland and Ireland. And many of many of the ancestors of, of many of our Americans were indentured when they got here. And a lot of contemporary families don't know that. So how do we change the culture of violence? You know, with within the designs and the needs assessments and all of the methodological things that we're doing, there's an overarching culture, which is reflected in television, which is reflected in the rap music, which is reflected oftentimes in sports. So any ideas for how we change the fundamental culture of this country to go from a violent mentality to a peaceful mentality? And just one other comment, uh, we started out 12 years ago wanting to help young people go through school and get careers and all. And when we heard about Trayvon Martin, we just got so upset. It wasn't the first time we knew about the violence, but it just seemed so impactful because it was on video. So we started a day of nonviolence, then we went to a week. And in October, we've been doing a month of nonviolence. And it's been really interesting to hear what the young people think about the future, how they don't trust adults, how they want to be trained in learning how to use guns. So how do we change the culture? Uh, I think I, sorry, brother um, yeah, I I would I would like to speak on that briefly. Um I really believe um that that change starts with the one. You know, I think a lot of the efforts reflect this increasing need to kind of change that culture within our own homes and within ourselves, because I agree. I think there's a lot of that us versus them ism still. And I think there's a lot of issues where there's feelings that, you know, that's how previous generations did it and that's fine. So we can perpetuate those kinds of decisions. But I think, um, yeah, that any efforts made to improve ourselves and to improve our families and to improve our familial cultures in order to be more compassionate and be more aware of others and use more peaceful practices. I think that's a huge win, you know, kind of like how Rivera said, we may not solve gun violence, but we can intercede case by case. 
I think it's very similar. I think with little decisions comes great change. And so as we work with our communities and as we expand these projects to more individuals and more families and more subgroups within the community, I think the hope is that the culture within those groups can change and that can radiate out to bigger areas. Okay. I would agree with that, uh, Mary and Stephanie. Dr. Stephanie, it's, uh, in my opinion, is it's really basic community. It's your neighborhood. It, it's not just your home. It's your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I can look at the street where I live, and there's six houses, and I know that three of them are politically vastly different than what I, I am, and the other three are more uh, how I am. And we decided that we have, if we are going to live together, that we have to act as good neighbors. That doesn't mean we can't discuss our differences, but it means we have to be, we have to have respect. And I hear a lot, you know, about we should love everyone. And I kind of joke with people and say, well, I'm sorry, I don't love everyone. I, there's some people I don't even like, <laughs> but I would give you my respect just because you are a human being. Mm -hmm. And when I teach a nonviolence course, when I take the materials that I learned through uh, the courses at Pachiabeni and I go to my community, that's the thing I try to reflect that we, and we start with ourselves, we start with our neighbors, it goes to our community and change goes from bottom up. It does not go from top down. And I've seen it work in the environment, so I know that it can work. But it's an ongoing thing that you can never stop. I guess when I slide into the grave, that's when it will be over. So the work you're doing with Black women for positive change, that's, there you are. You're doing it. Mm -hmm. Keep doing it. That's it. Thank you for that perspective. If I may interject, I think um, I think part of the what we see modeled on our TVs as far as the way to communicate with each other has really um, created a, a a huge wedge um, between peoples. Um, and if there's a way that we could be used to find commonalities with our neighbor, like you were saying, uh, Ruth Ann, uh, with our neighbors, find um, things that we can agree about and then model a way that we can have, um, like you said, respectful conversations around the things that we disagree about, but still um, value each other, the integrity of each other as people. But what we see on our airwaves is that if you align as such and such or such and such, you are a horrible person. And it creates this real, um, there's this been this real devolution of, of, um, respect for people in the last like 15 years um, or so. May, I mean, it's been more than that, but I mean, I think it's like really turned up um, a lot lately. And so how do we, how do we combat the, the misinformation, but also the, the, the little things that actually are designed to, to create wedges between people um, that I really, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, does anybody have a any strategies? <laughs> yes. I don't I don't have a strategy, but I think what creates the wedge between people is fear. I yeah. think many, many, many of us live in fear. And fear brings uh, no trust. There is very little trust in this country, in anything, anybody. And I don't, I don't have a strategy for that, but I, um, I sense that by meeting people who uh, don't think like us, who are not our normal environment, our normal safe environment. Um, I, I was part for a while at, at the Faith in Action community here, and we had to go somewhere where we didn't feel safe to go and to meet people. 
and uh, our group chose to go in the jail. And from these really started the sense that uh, people who are very fearful of are as fearful as we are. And by being able to share that and to feel the common humanity, you know, that we, uh, that we want to, to get to, you know, we are, we are all one big family. Those little example uh, helps. Well, fear is real. Yeah. Yeah, fear is real. And, and a lot of young people in this country are afraid every day. And a lot of people are afraid of what the police will do to them. And their fear is real. So yeah. we've got to change the people who are creating the fear. Yeah. Dr. Stephanie, that's what I was going to say, this multifaceted approach that we need the individual, you know, change. And we also need these systemic policies that, you know, will will really, you know, if it's being modeled at the top and the bottom and the middle, you know, this, this multifaceted different entry points to, to shift the culture. And we know that it only takes, it's something like, you know, two to 4% for there to be a shift in culture. So how do we really create a base that you know within ourselves we model it for ourselves our family our community and that it radiates up right mm -hmm. and then it also radiates from the top you know we by becoming a compassionate city we changed a lot of the ways in which we enact policy so we have equity-based budgets now and we also have a welcome center so this fear of migrants you know we're very close to the border we're about three hours but our mayor has you know, just said, we're going to welcome immigrants. That's what we're going to do. So modeled it. And then our policies have also got, gone into, you know, the, the funding that we're going to have a migrant resource center that's going to welcome people. And there's laws and there's what we're going to do and how we're going to treat people. So I, I think it's that multifaceted approach. You know, it's organizations like yourself. It's So I'm, I'm very hopeful, y'all. So thank you for... Um, being here in community because I was teaching nonviolence today to students that were not mine and it was tough. <laughs> it was I think tough. that's that's a wonderful note to end on as a, a note of hope. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. And again, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, once again, I'm sharing the contact information um, if anyone is interested in connecting with us about AmeriCorps. Um, similarly, I put a link in the chat for a survey, which helps us kind of gauge the effectiveness of our programs and tailor programs to suit people's interests. So um, that feedback is really vital to us. Um, I'd also like to thank our speakers this evening. You were so generous with your time and your energy. And thank you so much for the amazing work you're doing. This is so necessary and vital um, for humanity and the planet, just all of it. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you all for being here and for the dedication that you've displayed in, in showing up and asking questions and, and having interest in, in making a better world. Um, so with that, thank you for attending our event this evening. And we look forward to seeing you throughout our schedule of events throughout the year. Um, we have a lot of events, activities, and programs ongoing. So um, please stay abreast of what we share. Um, in the meanwhile, um, keep on keeping on, y'all. You've done an amazing, uh, amazing job tonight. And um, again, you know, yes, I'm sharing this contact information as a plug for AmeriCorps, but at the same time, um, if you have any questions or I've already talked with people in the chat who are like, hey, I live here and I want to do something. I don't think I have capacity to start my own AmeriCorps program, but I just want to get involved. Still, please contact um, me. I'm happy to talk with anyone privately or do a one-to-one -one with anyone who just has a vision for bringing peace to their community. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for being here and have a wonderful evening. Okay, so long. All right. Take care. Take care, everybody. You will. Thank you. Thank you.